Now I'm going to talk to you tonight about a fascinating subject, a subject which has to do with the throne room of heaven. It has to do with perhaps, not only perhaps, but absolutely the greatest Star Wars battle for the throne. You see, tonight we're going to sweep aside the curtain and we're going to look at what, at what is going on in the universe. We're going to discover a Star Wars conflict far beyond our wildest imagination and anything you may have seen on the screen. You see, the War of Worlds features an amazing battle between good and evil angels. Angels are heavenly beings originally created by God to loyally serve Him and enjoy the glory of His presence throughout eternity. Angels are one of the dominant themes in the book of Revelation. The book opens with Jesus sending His angel to the apostle, the disciple and apostle John to reveal to him the truths of Revelation. You can read it in Revelation chapter 1. Angels reveal God's message in every age down through human history. In Revelation 2 and 3, those two chapters, angels are God's messengers to the seven churches. In Revelation 7, four angels stand on the four corners of the earth holding back the winds of destruction from totally devastating the earth just before the coming of Jesus. In Revelation 10, it pictures a mighty angel crying with a loud voice of warning to all of the earth's inhabitants. Revelation 14, fantastic chapter. I hope you are acquainted with Revelation 14. Three angels are pictured swiftly carrying God's amazing, urgent, end-time message to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, helps us to understand that God is preparing a people for the return of Jesus. Now, an angel unleashes in Revelation 16, seven vials. And a mighty angel carries God's last day message in Revelation chapter 18. Many times I refer to this as the fourth angel of Revelation 18. So angels play a major part. They are major characters in the book of Revelation. They're heavenly beings commissioned by God himself, invisible to human eyes, but nonetheless, angels are real. Revelation reveals an enormous struggle between good and evil, between Christ and Satan. Good angels exist, but I want to assure you that evil angels exist as well. The book of Revelation tells us how a war broke out in heaven. Combat erupted in paradise. Can you imagine? Angel armies took sides for a dramatic showdown. And the story is presented in a very dramatic way in symbols in Revelation in chapter 12. So let's look at it. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 to 9. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels, and Michael is Christ, and his angels fought with the dragon. And we'll find out the dragon is Satan. And the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer but they did not prevail. So the great dragon was cast out, 
that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. So where was it that he was cast out? Where did his angels get cast out? He was cast out to the earth. War in heaven? Angels fighting amongst themselves? Christ and Satan battling in heaven? How can this be? Now this brings up another very perplexing question or perhaps a series of questions. Why was there war in heaven? Where was this dragon from? Fortunately, the Bible gives us some very accurate cures, uh, clues. Let's repeat our theme for these meetings now. I want you to understand very importantly that if it's in the Bible, I believe it. In fact, let's say it together. If it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it disagrees with the Bible, it's not for me. You see, what we want to do is find out from the Bible a kind of prehistory of Satan and who he was and is. You can never fully understand the pain and the suffering in our world unless you understand what really went on behind the scenes in heaven itself. Now the book of Ezekiel in the Old Testament gives a picture into the heart of Lucifer himself. It reveals what he was thinking and what was going on in his mind. So let's read it together. Ezekiel 28 verse 12. Thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. This angel had a very special place near the throne of God himself. He was the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. He was created by God. He had to be in a perfect setting. However, it says in 14 and 15, you were the anointed cherub who covers, I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. Remember now, this is an extremely important part of the scripture. Lucifer and angels are created. Therefore, there is a creator who creates, all right? And this is the basis of much of the challenge that we're going to uncover. So you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. I want to assure you, absolutely, 100%, God did not create a demon. Understand that. He did not create the devil. According to the Bible we just read, he created a perfect angelic being, Lucifer. So the picture of Lucifer walking back and forth among these fiery stones suggests that someone who existed in the midst of the glory of God was Lucifer himself. He was there, near to the brilliance of the Holy One, the one who created him. But something happened to this amazing, wonderful angel. Verse 17 in Ezekiel 28. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. This angel became focused on himself on his own splendor, mesmerized or fixated by his own beauty. Now you know there are some beautiful things in life, some people who are very attractive, very beautiful, 
in some ways they are at a disadvantage because the devil can use that to draw them away from the one who created them to themselves. His pride led Lucifer into sin. How could this happen in a perfect universe? Well, there's only one way. And this is a very basic understanding that we must completely comprehend tonight. Otherwise, this controversy between good and evil, between Christ and Satan, will make no sense to you. Love can never be forced or coerced. It must come voluntarily from the heart. If you take away the opportunity to love, you take away the ability to be truly happy. Now, since God desired the ultimate happiness of all the creatures, he gave them the power of choice. He wanted all of his creation to love him, not by coercion, not by force, but voluntarily, because they loved their creator. So God gave Lucifer the power of choice. He had the freedom and the right to choose to love God. This meant he was also capable, as all of us are, to choose to not love. God didn't want just a lot of robots or puppets walking around. He wanted real, intelligent beings who would love and experience joy coming from their very own soul. And that couldn't happen unless there was the power of choice. Isaiah the prophet, tremendous book Isaiah is, Isaiah shows us how Lucifer himself chose to rebel against God and change to become a fallen angel. In chapter 14 of Isaiah, we read, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. Do you catch an interesting word in there? I, 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 I. You see, Lucifer, he desired, he desired a higher position, an exalted throne, rulership, dominance. He wanted to be equal or even surpass God. And that's how it all started. That's how this angel began his tragic fall, a fall that would put a lot of other angels in a very difficult situation, and many other angels would follow him in this fall. What is the origin of iniquity and sin? It's unclear to us, but somehow it started because Lucifer chose not to love God. Now, by contrast, in the Bible, in 1 John 4, verse 8, it says God is love. Love is the foundation of God's government. Not force, not coercion. You can never successfully force love. Love was all around Lucifer. But Lucifer turned away from that heavenly love, finally turning farther and farther away from God. Lucifer began to see God as, unbelievably, as a rival. Can you imagine? His twisted mind began to picture God as the enemy. The Bible tells us about the results. Back in Ezekiel 28, we're back in that chapter, verse 6. You have set your heart as the heart of a god. 
Lucifer began to think, why is it that God should have all the power and the authority? He imagined himself to be a God just as qualified as God himself to run the universe. Now, try to imagine this, this, this kind of disturbance that was caused in heaven itself. Imagine a place where jealousy and slander and malice never existed, and it never occurred to anyone to even question the love of God. And suddenly, this brilliant Lucifer, this one that had such a high place, this cherub so close to the throne of God itself, and he's walking in these fiery stones, he starts making these offhanded, quiet, subtle remarks, not openly challenging God, but questioning how God was, was kind of doing things. I mean, why, why does God have to have all the glory? Why, why, why every created being, why do we have to obey God? And he suggests that maybe, and he did all of this very subtly, maybe there's an alternative. Maybe there's a better way to run the universe. Carefully, artfully, subtly, he shares this lie quietly amongst the angels, claiming that God was, can you believe it, unfair unjust in his administration of the entire universe and the divine government. So now the question is, how would God face Lucifer with this challenge? You know, maybe many people would wish, why didn't God just destroy Lucifer? We wouldn't be in this mess today. We wouldn't have wars and pain and difficulty and disease and all kinds of challenges in life, he just should have destroyed him. Well, if this had happened, if then Lucifer had been cut off at the very beginning point, something could have developed which would have been just as difficult. You know, you ask the question, why not eliminate evil before it spread to the other worlds. Why didn't God just execute Lucifer? Well, what would have been said by all the watching angels? Let me ask a question. If someone spreads a lot of lies about the king or the country of a president, and then the liar is executed, would this prove that the lies were false? Or would people always wonder a little bit, I wonder whether those lies were actually true. You see, God's reputation and his credibility were at stake when Satan delivered his haughty challenge against God. So the question really is raised, is God really just? Is his way really best. Destroying the opposition wouldn't have answered that challenge. Instead, God chose a wiser course that certainly is a more difficult one, but in the end, we'll see how it proves to be the wisest way. He would allow sin to exist in the universe for a period of time. Not forever, but for a period of time. And that existence would fully demonstrate that rebellion against God does not bring happiness, but absolute disaster and destruction. The universe, including every one of us here in the Warren Performing Arts Center, and all of you watching on live streaming, wherever you are in this world, all of us had to see for ourselves, and today have to see for ourselves, to know that God is a God of love. 
and his way is best beyond a shadow of any doubt because that was the way that God could solve the problem of evil once and for all. Now, as we mentioned before, love depends on free choice. But we will not choose to love one we do not first trust. God wants us to trust him, to see that his way brings joy and happiness and security to the universe so that no one, no one in the future, and let me tell you, there is an end to evil. There will be an end to evil, and we are sharing that with you. The Bible shares that with you. But until that time, no one will question God's character in the end after having seen the results of sin, and no one will ever choose evil again. So every question has to be answered. The problem was Lucifer could not remain in heaven. Going now to the wonderful book of Revelation, which we're focusing on in Revelation of Hope, chapter 12, verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out. Now, the Bible itself, this verse, gives the explanations immediately of who the dragon was and is. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Well, <laughs> you might be saying, okay, Pastor, that's, that's very explanatory in the Bible, but why did earth become a dumping ground in the cosmic conflict? Was Satan just banished to the earth and the earth's first inhabitants, they, they opened a door to him? What, what happened? Well, the first book in the Bible, Genesis, there are 66 books in the Bible. The first one, Genesis, tells us that everything was good when God created the earth. And that included the first human beings, Adam and Eve. Let me underline again. This is a good point. People on this earth, the human race, was a created race by God himself not evolving over millions and billions of years, but created by God himself. They were perfect. They were moral beings. They had the capability of loving, not only each other, but loving God. And God gave them the freedom to choose. He gave them the opportunity by creating two trees. The tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. By choosing to eat of the tree of life, they showed their loyalty to God. But God forbade them to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. By disobeying and eating of that tree, they would be choosing against God and for Satan's side of the war. Now, when Eve wandered over to this forbidden tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God had said, I give you everything, everything in this garden, and believe me, the Garden of Eden was beyond any comprehension that we have today of magnificent setting. Everything was available. You didn't have to go to a supermarket. You just walked over and took it. It was there. But there was one tree. Don't go near that tree. Unfortunately, evil, uh, evil came into this earth, and then it came in the form of the devil tempting Eve. And Eve wandered over to that tree, Satan disguised as a serpent, that's why scripture tells us he's the serpent, had the opportunity to spread his lies. 
And God had said that if they ate of the tree, they would die. But Satan said something, and this is the first lie recorded. You will not surely die. Now God knows that the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That's what the serpent was saying. Can you imagine <laughs> Eve looking at this serpent that was speaking? And uh, in the days of Eden, serpents were very beautiful. Today, most people don't like snakes or serpents, but serpents were beautiful. Satan was essentially saying, you will have greater happiness if you follow me. God is restricting your freedom somehow. Tragically, Eve and her husband, Adam, accepted that lie. And today we see the results of this choice all around us. Satan's alternative is not anything like that serpent in Eden advertised. We live on a planet that is in rebellion, a planet full of decay and death. After Adam and Eve ate of that forbidden tree, they were filled with guilt and, and anxiety. And when God came looking for them in the garden, and it says, that he would have meetings with them. Every day it was a wonderful thing to have a meeting with the Creator, and he came to the garden looking for them, and they hid their faces from him. We've been running and hiding ever since. Sin produces this alienation between us and God. It produces conflict and and, and dissonance between people. The seeds of the first war were planted in the hearts of our first parents when they sinned. The reason there is so much abuse in the home, why there is so much animosity in the world, is that sin has infected the human heart. When fellow human beings get into this terribly anxious and angry setting, they are alienated not only from each other, but from God. They, became, they become alienated on all sides. Sin produces anxiety, fear, suffering, death. Well, you can say, but who's responsible? Well, Jesus told a parable about a good man who planted good seed in his field. But sometime later, his servants went out and found some terrible weeds growing among the good plants. When they asked the good man what happened, Matthew 13, 28, records that he said to them, an enemy has done this. So when we're perplexed and, and we ask, why are there so many tragic situations of sickness, heartache, atrocities, brokenness in this world, we find the answer in these, wor in these words, that God is not responsible. An enemy has done this. God planted good seed. He didn't sow sickness and suffering and death. An enemy of God and human beings came with deception and lies, sowing seeds of destruction in the good that God had created. Now, the Bible consistently identifies this enemy as Satan. He is the adversary. He is the accuser. He is the devil. He is the one who rebelled against God and unleashed the whole sin problem in Scripture. The devil isn't some fairy tale-like figure that flits around with a pitchfork. In fact, I want to tell you, the devil loves people to believe that he looks like that. Because then they make fun of it. 
and they don't take it seriously. But he is a very real being who causes very real tragedies, and he's a very clever deceiver. He deceived one-third of the angels in heaven. One-third. And they, along with Lucifer, the devil, Satan, the dragon, were cast out of heaven. They knocked on the door of planet Earth. God wanted that door to be forever shut. But as Satan knocked, Eve and then Adam responded. Eve opened the door. Satan said to Eve, God is unjust. God is restricting your happiness. You'll be happier if you listen to me and partake of this fruit. She opened that door, and Adam followed her lead. And as a result, sickness, suffering, heartache, death have come into this world. This earth got caught in the crossfire because the deceiver tricked our first parents and we're all related. Doesn't matter what race you are from, what background you are from, what uh, status you are in, we are all related. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are from the first parents. Adam and Eve, and more lately, from Noah and his family. In any case, the earth got caught in this crossfire and in this rebellion that our parents, our first parents, were trapped in. It became a world in rebellion. Well, the question could be asked, why doesn't God do something? Well, right there in the Garden of Eden, God made the most magnificent promise in all of Scripture to rebellious humanity, Adam and Eve. God promised he would restore everything that was lost by sin. Let's read it. One of the most magnificent prophecies in Scripture, embedded early in Scripture in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. And I will put enmity, or complete dissonance and tension and, and anger, between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. He, Christ, the Messiah, will come. Right there in the Garden of Eden, the Messiah was promised, and he would give to Satan a deadly striking blow. He would crush Satan's head, but in the process, he would receive a wound on his heel. In the process of striking a fatal blow to Satan, Jesus would receive a tragic wound himself on the cross. The blow would not annihilate the Savior, however. He would rise victoriously as our Redeemer, our Savior, our Lord, and our coming King. How would God answer Satan's challenge? How would love stand out in contrast to the selfishness portrayed by Satan, by the dragon, by the devil, by the old serpent? Christ would come. He would be suspended on a cross. Nails would be driven into his hands, hanging there between heaven and earth, he would demonstrate to the whole universe that God really does care, that God loves us. And the death of Jesus Christ, the one whom the devil, Lucifer, who was so close to Christ and the Father and the Holy Spirit, 
Christ himself, the one whom Satan longed to somehow supersede, that Christ would demonstrate the greatest and most profound love of all, dying for you and for me. In the death of Christ, we would see principalities and powers of hell cast down because the cross reveals the enormity, the unfathomable depth of God's love. Our Lord cries out in Jeremiah, Old Testament, chapter 31, verse 3. Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. God would come to this world in rebellion. He would come as a baby born of the womb of Mary. He would face Satan's challenge head on. Why doesn't God do something, someone may ask. He has. Adam and Eve sinned. They rebelled against God. God did not destroy this earth. He did not push this world into outer space far beyond anything that anyone could contact. Heaven responded to Satan's challenge with love. Heaven answered Satan's questions with love. Heaven revealed that love had a plan. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 3, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. So what is the mystery of the ages? The mystery of the ages is this. How could God love us so much? Lucifer challenged God's government in heaven. He accused God of being unfair. The mystery of the ages is that God loves us. He loves you, every one of you. The mystery is that God's love will go to any depth to save you and me. There is no valley so deep, no pit so dark, where God's love cannot reach down and touch any one of us. There's no place where you can wander that God's love cannot reach you. There's no place that you can run so far from him that his love will not seek you out. Satan is a liar. He says, God doesn't love you. He makes you feel worthless. But look, but the nails in my hands, Christ says. Satan says that God doesn't love you, but Jesus cries out, but look at the crown of thorns on my head. Satan says, Christ doesn't love you, but Jesus responds, I went all the way to the cross and the grave for you. I took the penalty of sin. That sin, that penalty which you deserved, I took on myself. He hung his head and died on that Friday long ago. And he said, it is finished. And then, the next day, on the Sabbath, in the quietness of the tomb, he rested. But the next day, the first day of the week, Something happened. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. An angel descends and the stone is rolled away and Christ comes forth alive. He is risen. He is risen. And he ascends to heaven. The good news is he's alive today. Amen. God has done something about the problem of evil. He has provided a savior for those who were tricked into the slavery of the devil. He sent Jesus Christ to suffer and to die. Why doesn't God do something? To anyone who asks that question, you can say, he did, he has, 
He has provided for our eternal life. He entered this snake pit of a world with all of its evil, and he fought in the decisive battle of human history in a mortal combat to defeat Satan for you and you and you and for me. Christ triumphed over Satan on the cross. There, Jesus revealed his eternal love for all the universe to see. There, Jesus paid redemption's price for our sins. But that's not all. Listen, Hebrews chapter 4. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. It's a magnificent scripture. Jesus is our creator, our redeemer, our high priest, our master physician, our master teacher, our coming king, and our best friend. Why didn't God do something? He is doing something. He has done something. He will do something. He is our Lord. He is the high priest in heaven, and he is pleading his merits of sacrifice on our behalf. Right now, his grace is available to you and to me, whatever your situation is. But there's more. God's done something, and he is doing something. But the Re book of Revelation tells us God will yet do something. One day, sin and wickedness will come to a complete end. God will destroy Satan forever. Satan will not have his way forever. The garden promise Genesis 3.15 will be fulfilled. Christ will totally crush and stamp out Satan and all evil forever. Amen. Here's how Revelation puts it. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Now, the prophet Ezekiel adds these words in verses 18 and 19 from 28, the chapter 28. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. One day... Satan will be consumed. He will be turned to ashes. He will be gone forever. One day, the universe will be clean. Jesus and his people will reign triumphantly. The Bible, this precious ancient book that has survived the test of time, tells us that a time is coming when only peace and love will remain. Sin, sorrow, suffering, heartache will be no more. God is love. His way is the best. And one day that way will prevail not only on this earth but throughout the universe because people will understand that the foundation of God's government is love. We will continue in this series to look at the big issues in this warfare between good and evil, between Christ and Satan, and what heartache and loss it has caused. You see, the Bible tells us so very much. We'll learn why Satan 
has such hatred towards God and his people and those who follow the book, the Bible. We'll learn more about the plan to save those who come to Christ and how it's implemented and how you and I can have assurance of this offer of salvation, of eternal life. It is real and can be ours. Amen. We're going to study about the ministry of Christ in heaven right now as our high priest. We'll study about what Christ has revealed in the manner in which he will return the second time. You will not want to miss that presentation. We'll see what the issues are surrounding the mark of the beast and the harlot of Babylon. We'll also learn about the glorious home of the redeemed. That's a sermon I love to preach, and I know you will be thrilled. We're going to find out what the Bible says about God moving the capital of the universe to this very planet. We'll find out when that is going to happen and what it's going to be like. You'll find in these presentations and in these studies a beautiful picture of God in great contrast to the ugly, empty system that the devil offers. You see, Satan rebelled in heaven, and he follows the same tactics today. He leads us to rebel against God on some point in our life. Our only safety is totally, completely surrendering our lives to the living Jesus Christ. It is never too late or too early to follow God's way. Right now, we can commit ourselves to join Christ's side of this great controversy. We can't close this study without giving you an opportunity to make a special commitment to God. To the degree that you understand his love and wisdom in dealing with this problem of rebellion in the universe, would you like to be on God's side? Would you like to choose to be on his side? If so, I invite you to ponder it carefully as Charles comes to sing this magnificent song, The Love of God. Pure. How measureless. If you were to take a quill or a pen and the oceans were all ink, the sky could not contain from side to side the amazing love of God. Amen. Why didn't God do something? He did. Amen. How many of you tonight would like to raise your hand and say, Lord, I want to be on your side. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for this magnificent promise in Genesis 3.15 that portrayed what Christ would do because he loved us with an everlasting love and what he is doing for us as our high priest in heaven, interceding for us. He has made every provision for us to be in a future world eternally with happiness, with truth, and with him. Now, Lord, bless each one who has raised his or her hand, stating they want to be on your side. We know the devil is not happy with that decision, so please, Lord, send legions of angels to surround everyone here and protect them from the deception of the devil that serpent, the accuser, and help us to respond by saying, thank you, Lord, for what you have done, for you gave everything you had 
in Jesus Christ, who came to die for us and rose and is again interceding for us. Thank you, Lord. Bless each one who has made a decision tonight. Bring them back here safely tomorrow night as we continue our focus on revelation of hope. And we thank you for the love of God. We ask all of this in the powerful name of that one who has made it all possible, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.